This program is brought to you by Emory University. Michael Martyr is the Iker Basque Research Professor of Philosophy at the University of the Basque Country, Victoria Gastis. Um, his areas of specialization are phenomenology, ethics and political philosophy, philosophy of nature, aesthetics, and the philosophy of plant life. Um, he is the co-editor with Marcia Sakhalavante Schubach um, and Peter Trani um, of Heidegger's On Hegel's Philosophy of Right, the 1934-35 seminar interpretive essays, um, which you may have found uh, on the table um, outside. There's several sample copies um, and also information um, here on this flyer about how to order. I believe there's a discount as well if you use it. Um, and it was also translated by Andrew Mitchell. Um, also, Pro Professor Martyr has published many books, including um, Groundless Existence, The Political Ontology of Carl Schmitt, Plant Thinking, A Philosophy of Vegetable Life, Phenomena Critique Logos, The Project of Critical Phenomenology, The Philosopher's Plant, An Intellectual Herbarium, um, and his forthcoming works include Pyropolitics, When the World is Ablaze, and Dust. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Martyr presenting the other Jewish question. Thank you, Kate, for this introduction. I'm also very grateful to uh, Andrew uh, Mitchell for the invitation that he so kindly extended to me and to Emory University for uh, hosting this very important uh, conference. Uh, now, as you will have surmised from uh, my title, uh, The Other Jewish Question, it alludes to Marx's 1843 essay on the Jewish question. But before I align that text with the comments Heidegger made about the Jews in the already published volumes of the Black Notebooks, separated from Marx's essay by roughly one century, I'd like to highlight a word that, despite being uttered, is typically not heard at all in this context, namely, the question. In what sense can the existence of a certain group or people become a question? For whom are they a question? To whom is it addressed? What of self-questioning, putting oneself into question, still prior to making a fateful decision on one's own being, which presumably defines the human? And above all, how does it stand with what Heidegger himself reveres as the question worthy? Uh, I quote, that question that alone opens up the worthiness of the question worthy, the question of the truth of being, unquote. My hunch is that the root of the problem with Heidegger's antisemitism is his failure first, and obviously, to turn the figure of the Jew, let alone international Jewry, which he parades on the pages of the Black Notebooks, into a question, and second, and worse yet, to interrogate the very logic and necessity of coming up with a concrete figuration, a clandestine agency, if you will, for the nihilistic completion of metaphysics. So uh, in, in a nutshell, when Heidegger resorted to this metaphysically constructed figure of the, of, of the Jew, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he, he was endowing his uh, uh, history of being with a figuration of the end of metaphysics. And in and of itself, this gesture seems to me to be contradictory. Much more than a temporary lapse of critical vigilance is at issue in this dual failure. By slotting a raw, determinate figure into his grand history of being, particularly when this history uh, and when being itself comes detached from beings, Heidegger conjugates the most question-worthy and what he treats as the least question-worthy, right? And so the term being historical antisemitism, coined by Peter Travny, condenses in itself this very a or pre-logical contradiction, this hidden clash of the least and the most question-worthy in Heidegger's philosophy. Right? For no matter how world jury is metaphysically deployed and loaded with the dirty work of world destruction, absent the questioning impulse, its insertion within the being historical narrative will not rise to the thought of being. So this formal structure or the system that Peter was talking about in his remarks is not sufficient really to, uh, 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 to account for the centrality or the essentiality of the insertion of this figure of, of, of the Jew in uh, Heidegger's philosophy unless we are also focusing on the deformalizing power of the question which is really absent on, on these pages. 
To be sure, there are different ways of refusing the question. On the one hand, this refusal may be attributed to a deficit of reflection and critique. In considerations nine of the notebooks, Heidegger appeals to the courage necessary for fundamental reflections. In his words, the courage to track one's own presuppositions back to their ground and to interrogate the necessity of the goals one has set. This for him is the essential task of self-reflection understood not in a crass psychological, characterological, or biological typological sense, but ontologically, as asking about, quote, being and its truth and its grounding and lack of grounds, unquote. Needless to say, Heidegger did not track his own presuppositions about the Jews to their ground, did he lack the courage to do so, but fell back on characterological and typological crudities surrounded by a mere facade of ontological significance. So this is one way of uh, refusing the question. On the other hand, the refusal of the question may resort to a kind of ultra-questioning, as it does in Derrida's Of Spirit. Although Heidegger, in Derrida's words, almost never stops identifying what is highest and best in thought with the question, with the decision, the call, or the guarding of the question, unquote, the possibility or the privilege of the question is itself unquestioned. Questioning the question is in turn subverting the sovereignty of critique and of the subject who launches it. More than that, it is a precondition for radical hospitality whereby the other is not put to the question in the inquisitorial or inquisitional mode, but maintains the right to interrogate the I. So those are the two, broadly speaking, the two ways of uh, refusing the question. Far from contemplating the second way, a conscious refusal of the question, Heidegger forges out of, uh, out of it, out of the question, a polemical weapon, an implement in an attack, an griff, that is meant to outstrip the power of critique itself. And I quote from volume 96 of uh, Gesamtausgabe. The attack on Descartes, that is the counter-questioning that is appropriate to his basic metaphysical position on the basis of a fundamental overcoming of metaphysics, can be carried out only by asking the question of being. So he affirms at that particular moment, he affirms the necessity of the question of being, which is more radical still than uh, critique. Along the same lines, he confesses, I quote again, my attack on Husserl, the same word is used here, my attack angriff, on Husserl is not directed against him alone and in general is inessential. The attack is against the neglect of the question of being, unquote. For all its phenomenological insight, its rejection of psychological explanations and historiological reckonings of opinions, Husserl, Husserl's philosophy for Heidegger never reaches into the domain of essential decisions, in his words. Why? Because, as Heidegger declares in the same paragraph of the Black Notebooks, the power of jury, which hinges on the spread of an otherwise empty rationality and calculative skills, is powerless insofar as essential decisions are concerned. Now, the strong implication here the strong implication is that despite coming closer to the ontological domain than the Jew Freud, another uh, designation that uh, Heidegger himself bestows, uh, the Jew Husserl could not free himself from the power that blocked his access to the question of being. Right before he opens the brackets in which he discusses his attack on Husserl, Heidegger notes emphatically, again a quote, the more original and inceptive the coming decisions and questions become, the more inaccessible they will remain to this race in quotation marks, the Jews. Unquote. The limits of Husserl's philosophy to which these decisions and questions remain opaque are thus presumably demarcated by his Jewishness. Now, in this regard, I'm reminded of a bitterly ironic episode from my own biography. While I was still attending primary school in Moscow during the 1980s, my mother inquired during parents' night as to the reasons why, among all the other subjects, Russian language was the only one that did not merit the maximum grade of five on my transcript. The teacher's response was brutally honest. Well, of course, because a Jew cannot master Russian for a five. Right. On the surface of it, Heidegger seems to say the same about Husserl's philosophy. Well, of course, it fell short of the highest ontological question, the phenomenological rejection of psychologism, biologism, and historicism notwithstanding. How could it not, seeing that Husserl belongs to the race to which fundamental decisions and questions are foreclosed? 
The point, however, is that Heidegger does not as isolate the Jews from other groups that are similarly oblivious to being, notably the Cartesians, but also the Bolsheviks, the English, the Americans, the list goes on. He showcases them as though they were different specimens of an indifferent metaphysical nihilism. Still, in and of itself, this non-differentiation among political orientations, nationalities, philosophical positions, and so forth, the non-differentiation that mirrors the at times oversimplified story about the forgetting of being in the West, within which wildly dissimilar philosophies appear to be interchangeable, this non-differentiation is indicative of the persistence of the unquestioned in the thick of the essential question and of the thoughtless to be distinguished from the unthought in the midst of rigorous thought. In light of the two ways of rebuffing the question, then, the unreflecting and the hospitable, the Jewish question can be finally reframed. If a certain critical deficit needs to be remedied, then we must intensify the questioning impulse, keeping fast to the ground rules of fundamental ontology. We should keep Heidegger to his word, as it were, where he uh, uh, did not live up to the task. Instead of spawning caricature-like avatars of Western metaphysics, we would then allow the who of the questioner or the self-questioner to flourish. The existential freedom of this flourishing dovetails with the other method for dealing with the Jewish question, resolving it as a question not with a view to provi providing a definitive answer or a solution. This is who a Jew is. This is the national belonging that defines Jewishness. And we're all familiar with the horror of final solutions. But we should do so with an eye to the emancipation of the questioned and questioning subjects alike, right? So this is a possible path in a kind of broad brush strokes toward uh, an opening of the question where it has been foreclosed in Heidegger's own text. I use this word emancipation. And of course, it is one of the first words in Marx's on the Jewish question, emancipation, emancipation. Everything then revolves around the meanings of this word taken in the political, civic, religious, or humanist senses in Marx's essay. To this list, we should add the patently Heideggerian existential emancipation, which requires one to ask who rather than what a human being is, and by implication, uh, a Jewish person, for example, is. What does one free oneself from when one is liberated from the what modality of the question? Among other things, uh, it's clear that for Heidegger in, in the Black Notebooks, one frees oneself from the predetermination of humanity by animality. In his words, the modern anthropological determination of man and with it all previous anthropology, Christian, Hellenistic, Jewish, and Socratic, Platonic. Like Bruno Bauer, with whose insights Marx engages in his text, Heidegger thinks that the Jew cannot be emancipated as a Jew any more than a Christian can be, can be emancipated as a Christian or a Platonist as a Platonist. On the terms of Judaic, Christian, Hellenistic, and modern metaphysics, existential emancipation is impossible unless it goes beyond the confines of these systems of thought. The anthropological positing of the Jewish question within and beyond Judaism is bound to be what is a Jew, not who. Now, I think that it's also significant that oppositions such as Jew-Christian or Jew-Greek become insignificant, become ephemeral, uh, because they are, for Heidegger, epiphenomenal in relation to the all-encompassing animalization of the human. Now, Marx suggests that the opposition Jew-Christian, for example, will be resolved or dissolved, not thanks to finding a deeper ideational ground uniting the two and subsequently discounting it as a vestige of the same anthropological prejudice, but through meticulous historical political work. So for Marx, the opposition Jew Christian can be resolved only through a, a kind of historical political work. The first stage in this work involves a critique of religion as such, rather than of Judaism, unable or unwilling to drop the attitude of a foreigner toward the state, in Marx's words. And I quote Marx. The most stubborn form of the opposition between Jew and Christian is the religious opposition. How is an opposition resolved? By making it impossible. And how is religious opposition made impossible? By abolishing religion, unquote. The second stage elaborates a critique of the state as such. Remember, we 
so, so the first stage was not a uh, critique of Judaism, but of religion as such. Now, uh, uh, we are not criticizing with Marx a Christian state, but the state as such. Unable, uh, and of course, the Christian state is unable at the time or unwilling to extend recognition to the Jews. I quote again from Marx, we criticize the religious failings of the political state by criticizing the political state in its secular form, disregarding its religious failings. But political emancipation is not the final and absolute form of human emancipation. So the third and highest stage of emancipation for Marx in, uh, on the Jewish question is this human emancipation, uh, which is neither religious nor political. In other words, as is the case in Heidegger, albeit for different reasons entirely, Marx's Jewish question is neither a question nor one about the Jews proper, but the pretext for a meditation about modernity. Right? So this is what uh, both of them really do. They, they turn uh, 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 the Jewish question not into a question, but into a kind of assertion of the, uh, uh, of the way things are, and uh, they use that assertion as a pretext for the meditation about modernity. A third stage of emancipation, sil silently coded as communism, will be announced at the end of Marx's influential essay. But how do the first two resonate with what Heidegger has to say about the Jews in the Black Notebooks? Marx's question is formulated more or less conventionally with regard to Jewish particularity, their non-participation in and subtraction from the universality of the political sphere. Uh, and this political sphere can be filled with Christian content or rendered formal and abstract in a secular state. It doesn't really matter, right? So the figure of the Jew is the figure of the particularity that cannot be accommodated within the universality of the political sphere. Heidegger turns this formulation upside down so that empty rationality, the empty rationality which I have already mentioned, as well as in his words, the tenacious skillfulness of calculating, disseminating the worldlessness of abstraction worldwide are embodied in the Jews. For Marx, the Jewish question rests upon the stubborn exceptionalism of the Jews combined with the dream of a universal emancipation from religious differentiations and the bourgeois political form alike. For Heidegger, on the other hand, Jewry is not an exception but the rule at this late stage of Western metaphysics at, at its end. Uh, Jury is not the exception but the rule, which is in his peculiar vernacular, given the designation the gigantic, given that its worldlessness spreads around the world, transforming itself into the default state of modern humanity. Deplorable as this accusation might be, his reformulation of the question does not leave much space for genocidal fantasies of purification that in one way or another proceed along the lines of wishing if only the exception were eliminated. And I think that a uh, previous questioner has already alluded to this, that there you cannot really impute any sort of genocidal fantasy to this view of, uh, of the figure of the Jew, which becomes general as opposed to exceptional. It cannot be uh, eliminated as, as an exception can be wiped out, for example. Evidently, where the prevailing rule is defective, nothing short of a total overhaul of nihilistic worldlessness would do. Hence, the stress on the need for a new inception of the West and Heidegger. From Heidegger's perspective, Marx's proposal to abolish religion altogether and to promote scientific principles in its stead is actually the core of the problem, guilty of fostering the growing worldlessness of the world disembedded from its autochthonous foundation. An appropriate discipline for studying leveled down phenomena, leveled down social phenomena in particular, in such a world would be sociology, which as Heidegger remarks, and I quote, is gladly pursued by Jews and Catholics alike, unquote. Most likely, the remark itself is a job at Marx, among others. Be this as it may, in the list of disciplines or paradigms to which Heidegger voices his aversion, anthropology, psychoanalysis, biologism, psychologism, historicism, and so forth, sociology occupies a special place because it systematizes the breakdown of the world and gives it a scientific expression as something normal, right? as a normal constitution of, of society. At bottom, Heidegger would consider the opposition between religious and secular outlooks subject to overcoming in the initial project of Marxist emancipation, meaningless. For him, there is really no 
qualitative difference between religious and secular outlooks given the metaphysical heritage both partake of. Anticipating the thesis of secularization as a movement within Christianity, Marx himself admits that pitting the one at, uh, outlook against the other does not ring entirely true. He argues, and I quote, this is from uh, Marx's essay, the perfected Christian state is not the so-called Christian state which acknowledges Christianity as its basis, as the state religion, and thus adopts an exclusive attitude toward other religions. It is rather, so this perfected Christian state is rather the atheistic state, the democratic state, the state, the, the state which relegates religion among the other elements of civil society. So Marx clearly recognizes that what we call the atheistic secular state is in fact a permutation, a perfection in his words of a Christian state. For Marx, the atheistic state is the perfected fulfillment of a doctrinal Christian state. For Heidegger, the uprooted cosmopolitan Jewry is the purest culmination of Judaism. On the heights of metaphysics, the difference between religious and secular Jews, but also in a certain sense between Jews and non-Jews, vanishes. I quote uh, from the Black Notebooks, the question of the role of world Jewry is not a racial question, but the metaphysical question about the kind of humanity that without any restraints can take over the uprooting of all beings from being as its world historical task. And I highlight the words without any restraints here, I think. This is the, the important bit. This phrase, however, demands a scrupulous analysis going beyond the scope of the black notebooks to Heidegger's predecessors and to his other texts from the faithful period of the 1930s. And uh, some of this work has been done already by other speakers, uh, uh, very admirably so. Uh, so I would like to mention uh, first this idea of the Semitic nomads in Heidegger's 1933-34 uh, seminar on the essence and concepts of nature, history, and state, where in this long tradition of calling uh, Jewish people Semitic nomads, uh, who are not privy to the German experience of space as a fixed place of shared existence, he writes, or he says rather in this seminar, we heard that people and space mutually belong to each other. For Slavic people, the nature of German space would defini definitely be revealed differently from the way it is revealed to us. To Semitic nomads, it will perhaps never be revealed at all. And what is the nomad's experience of space, according to Heidegger? I quote again, history teaches us that nomads have not only been no made nomadic by the desolation of wastelands and, st and the steppes, but they have also left wastelands behind them where they found fruitful and cultivated land and that humans who are rooted in the soil have known how to make a home for themselves even in the wilderness, unquote. So it follows that the difference between the original Semitic nomads, that is religious Jews, and their modern counterparts, i.e. secular cosmopolitan Jews, is one of scale, not of kind. With modern uprootedness, nomadism seem, ceased to be an exception and has come to affect the whole planet with deserts expanding and forests diminishing at an alarming rate. The lack of any restraints that I highlighted in, uh, in, in the initial quotation from the Black Notebooks, the lack of any restraints in the world historical task of world Jewry is conditioned by the Jews not being bound to any determinate lived space in Heidegger's view. Moreover, Heidegger implies that the nomads' ruthless exploitation of and destructive passage through the places they encounter or on their errant itinerary parallels the unrestrained uprooting of all beings from being. The ontic displacement of traditional Jews sublimated into the secular version of Jewish cosmopolitanism has been thus translated into the ontological deracination of the world and of being itself, right? So we move from the ontic limited displacement of, of, of uh, religious Jews to a kind of generalized uh, Jewish cosmopolitanism and on to uh, the ontological uh, uprooting of all beings from being. The world historical task of world Jewry is therefore, for Heidegger, the denial to the world of its worldhood, of its placeness, irreducible to the grid of geometrical spatiality, and finally of its habitability. 
Now, I have no doubts whatsoever concerning the correctness of Heidegger's environmental views on world destruction and on the becoming a dump of our planet, which is reaching truly cosmic proportions given the increasing orbital debris rotating around the Earth today. What is obnoxious, of course, is the attribution of blame for the situation to Semitic nomads. Having said that, Heidegger's argument, including its ontological dimension, are not original. In the spirit of Christianity and its faith, Hegel foregrounds the revolt of Jewish law, a force of deadly ideality against life itself. And I quote from that essay by uh, the early Hegel. He writes, and since life was so maltreated in them, in the Jews, since nothing in them was left undominated, nothing sacrosanct, their action became the most impious fury, the wildest fanaticism. The great tragedy of the Jewish people is no Greek tragedy, it can rouse neither terror nor, nor pity. It can rouse horror alone. The fate of the Jewish people is the fate of Macbeth, who stepped out of nature itself, clung to alien beings, and so in their service had to trample and slay everything holy in human nature, had at last to be forsaken by his gods, since these were objects and he, uh, he their slave, and be dashed to pieces on his faith itself. End of quotation from Hegel. Okay. Now, how can one fail to see the connection between this passage, for instance, and Heidegger's idea of uprooting as a rebellion against nature and, in the last instance, against being, wherein beings are primordially rooted? Doesn't the qualification without restraints apply to, such, uh, to that uprooting which is stamped with the lethal force of the ideal set over and against nature and life itself? If I have shifted for the time being from Marx back to Hegel, that is because the emancipation from religion required by the author of On the Jewish Question does not accomplish anything within the Heideggerian scheme. The only effect it might have is that of generalizing the destructiveness of pure ideality with which Judaism is charged initially to the entire planet and then to being as such. What in the eyes of the young Hegel appears as the maltreatment mishandlung of life within and outside the Jewish people, under Heidegger's pen becomes the overpowering of life in machination. These are his words, right? So from Hegel's uh, uh, maltreatment of life, we move to the overpowering of life in machination. Alleged Jewish nihilism percolates from its religious core to the secular domain, where it assumes a properly metaphysical character that is continues to unfold in the guise of a scientific ontotheology. But how is it possible to square nihilistic hostility to life with the anthropological determination of the human as an animal, which according to Heidegger, Judaism shares with Hellenism and with Christianity? So we have another apparent contradiction here, right? This nihilistic hostility to life, the maltreatment uh, of life uh, in, in Hegel or the uh, overpowering of life in Heidegger and uh, this uh, anthropological determination of the human as an animal. Despite vehemently disowning uh, the racial nature of the Jewish question, it is in living according to the principle of race that Heidegger locates the power of overpowering life itself. I quote, through the concept of race, life is brought into the form of what can be bred, which constitutes a kind of calculation. The Jews, with their marked gift for calculation, have already been living for the longest time according to the principle of race. The establishment of racial breeding does not stem from life itself, but from the overpowering of life by machination. What machination is bringing about with such planning is a complete deracialization of peoples by fastening them into the equally constructed, equally divided arrangement of all beings. Right. So the formalization of life in the principle of race, the act of making life breedable, at the same time animalizes it and drains its vitality. So it transforms human life into a mere animal life and drains it of its vitality. Bred like the animals that they are in keeping with their anthropological predetermination, humans entrust their lives to a contentless calculative rationality. Nihilism and animality merge in the form of racial breeding and Heidegger again places the Jews at the center of the strange fusion based on the characterological conjecture of their marked gift for calculation. Regardless of all the intellectual contortions inherent in this argument, uh, reconciling nihilism and animality, 
It is glaringly obvious that having neglected the call of thinking, Heidegger indulges in extreme stereotyping insofar as he imputes mutually contradictory traits to the same stereotyped subject. The subhuman and the superhuman, an animal and the calculating machine, a racializing and the deracializing agent. And this list will only keep growing in what is to come next. Now, perhaps without realizing it, we have stepped over the threshold of the second stage of Marxist emancipation, namely the political. So I've discussed the relation between religious emancipation and Marx and Heidegger's note, notes, and now we are moving on, or we have already moved on, to, the, uh, to political emancipation. Marx made this kind of emancipation contingent on a critical appraisal of the state form, and in particular on a critique of the bourgeois state. In a nutshell, the modern state solves the Jewish question, along with every other problem of the sort, by driving a wedge between the abstract equality of political citizenship and universal participation on the one hand, and the pursuit of private interests and protection of basic liberties, such as the freedom of religion in civil society on the other. Right? This is the modern political solution, the bourgeois political solution to the Jewish question, but also to any other question of the sort. As Marx puts this, I quote, the consummation of the idealism of the state was at the same time the consummation of the materialism of civil society. The bonds which had restrained the egoistic spirit of civil society were removed along with the political yoke. Political emancipation was at the same time an emancipation of civil society from politics and from even the semblance of a general content, unquote. Just as Heidegger would regard as irrelevant the distinction between the religious and the secular manifestations of Semitic nomadism, so he would dismiss the difference between political idealism and the materialism of civil society. And Marx seems to uh, go some way uh, along this path as well. He, uh, he does recognize that the two are two sides of the same coin. Both essentially pertain to, uh, for, for Heidegger, to the completion of Western metaphysics, this extreme idealism of uh, the political state of abstract right on the one hand and the materialism of civil society and the economy on the other, are uh, the two sides, the two dimensions of the completion of Western metaphysics above and beyond the efforts that Marx pours into their dialectical reconciliation in communism. The political evil, as far as Heidegger is concerned, lies in the common foundation of the abstract state and the concrete civil society. What I have already quoted, this equally constructed, equally divided arrangement of all beings applies to economy or politics uh, regardless of the uh, distinctions between the two. Whether separated by private egoistic interests or united on the grounds of a shared abstract citizenship, we have no other choice but to enter such an arrangement, this equally constructed, equally divided arrangement, which is as much ontological as it is political. How is this order constructed? Through rampant ca calculation, deracialization, and the untethering of beings from being the three powers of machination Heidegger identifies with the Jews. Unlike Marx, then, he does not discern in the Jewish question one of many analogous emancipatory projects of modernity, but views it as the synecdoche of the end of metaphysics. He does not deny, to be sure, that the Jewish people had existed well before the latest phase in the history of being has commenced. Instead, he insinuates that the three powers of machination he associates with them, with the, uh, with the Jewish people, have gained extraordinary prominence in this epoch. While Heidegger's philosophy insists on a more or less straightforward inversion of the first and third of these powers, things get complicated when it comes to deracialization. I think that it would be fairly uncontroversial to say that Heidegger wishes to recover thinking beyond plan planning and calculation, and that he wants to reaffirm the bond between being and beings in the shape of ontological difference, right? So those two, uh, uh, th those two acts would undo the first and third uh, powers of machination he identifies with the Jewish people. But this difference, the ontological difference, and non-calculative thinking resist the abstract, uh, so both, both this difference and non-calculative thinking resist the abstract equality of the arrangement of all beings, reminiscent of the abstract equality of the bourgeois state criticized by Marx. 
But the race principle is by far not a panacea from the sameness that installs itself in the heart of a deracialized humanity. So here it's not a question of a mere inversion in that sense, even for, for Heidegger. Clumsily and objectionably, Heidegger presents the thesis of race and its antithesis with reference to the figure of the Jews. They overpower life by planning its form, breeding it, and by the same token, dissolving its qualitative difference in the indifferent calculative mold into which it is forced. So, if not the race principle, then what is meant to supplant the second power of machination? In the shorthand, the response would have to be a lived sense of history, a lived sense of history as, a, as opposed to an abstract arrangement. Immediately after he registered his onto political complaint about the creation of a leveled, leveled down, uh, homogeneous arrangement of all beings, Heidegger writes, I quote, deracialization goes hand in hand with the self-alienation of peoples, the loss of history that is of the domain of decision for being. Between the lines of this diagnosis, one can read another charge against the Semitic nomads. The Jews have been the most self-alienated of peoples because their history has not unfolded in a specific Jewish space in the manner that German history has taken place in a, Jew in a German space. For Heidegger, only in the unity of place and time of a people's existence can a decision for being be made. Without such unity, history can only appear as an abstraction, as world history, capital H, which is ultimately history-less for him. The uprooting from a place entails uprooting from history, marking the end of metaphysics as much as the nature of human experience as Heidegger construes or misconstrues it. Thus, in an earlier notebook, he writes, I quote, what is happening now is the end of history. It's the end of, of the history of the great inception. To know what is now happening as this end, hence remains denied from start to finish, to those who are appointed to begin this end in its most final forms, i.e. the gigantic, and to put forward the historyless in the mask of the historiological as history itself." Unquote. We have already seen how Heidegger deemed uh, the world jury with its presumed worldlessness to be the gigantic, thanks to, the, to generalizing its condition to the modern state of uprooting. The historyless is the temporal supplement to the spatial deracination uh, of, of uh, the Jewish people, so that jointly these two factors amount to worldlessness, right? To, so this would be the formal definition of worldlessness, I think, in, in this sense in Heidegger. It would be the uh, combination of the placeless and the historyless, right? The denial of both uh, lived uh, experience of uh, place and a lived experience of time. Now, as I pointed out in an article published in the New York Times in July of this year, uh, Heidegger has willfully, most likely, overlooked the uniqueness of the Jewish attachment to tradition. Right? I wrote uh, uh, then that, and I quote, the Jewish mode of rootedness was temporal rather than spatial. Before the Zionist project undertook to change the state of affairs, the Jews were grounded only in the tradition instead of a national territory. Such grounding is anathema to modern uprooting with which Heidegger hurriedly identified Jewish life and thought uh, and which is expressed precisely in the destruction of tradition. Right. So were he to have paid attention to this lived sense of history unbound from physical space, he would have thought twice before lumping together religious and secular Jews under the same heading of Semitic nomads. Granted, cosmopolitan, secular, and lar largely assimilated Jewry might have still corresponded to aspects of the unflattering portrait of uprooting painted by Heidegger, but so would also other atheists, be they cre from Christian or other backgrounds. Regarding Marx's view of history, Heidegger acknowledges that uh, it is, and I quote, uh, this is not from the notebooks, it's actually from the letter on humanism, right? Uh, uh, he acknowledges that Marx's view of history is superior to that of any other historical account insofar as it recognizes the estrangement indicative of, in his words, the homelessness of modern man." Unquote. Likewise, in the conclusion of On the Jewish Question, the fulfillment of history in a truly human emancipation, communism is still unnamed here, might resemble Heidegger's expectations for the other inception germinating in the completion of Western metaphysics. 
Every emancipation, Marx writes, is a restoration of the human world and of human relationships to man himself. It is possible, for instance, to hear the words the human world, menschliche Welt, with a Heideggerian ear in terms of a decisive victory in the struggle against worldlessness, historylessness, and the powers of machination. What speaks against such a, a charitable interpretation is the kind of reconciliation that Marx envisions for uh, the emancipatory world restoration. In the narrative structure of his essay, uh, of Marx's essay, feudal society was dissolved into its basic element, man, man or men, uh, but also into egoistic men who were its real foundation. These utility-maximizing members of civil society are the passive, apolitical, sensual subjects of need who have nothing to do with a political man, quote, the abstract artificial man, man as an allegorical moral person. So uh, at the end of Marx's essay, we see the split between the calculating uh, subjects of need, the economic subjects, and an abstract uh, artificial political man who is just an allegorical moral person. Only with the advent of communism or human emancipation will the confrontation of the actually existing member of civil society and the abstract political agent be sublated. I quote, when the real individual man has absorbed into himself the abstract citizen, when as an individual man in his everyday life, in his work and in his relationships, he has become a species being, and when he has recognized and organized his own powers as social powers so that he no longer separates the social power from himself as a political power. So Marx wants this reconciliation of social, political, and economic powers at the end of history that he calls communism. In light of Heidegger's assertions in the Black Notebooks, Marx's reconciliation would be a Jewish solution to the Jewish question. Whereas Marx detects an intense contradiction between the political and the economic, Heidegger pinpoints diverse manifestations of the Jewish powers of machination on both sides of the divide. The private, egoistic member of civil society represents the power of calculation, Abstract citizenship and public artificial allegorical personhood stand for a deracializing homogenization and the divorce of beings from being, right? So it's easy to recognize the three powers of machination as Heidegger put them in uh, this uh, solution that Marx gives us. If anything, the absorption of the one and the other, of the ideal political actor in the real egoistic individual would be token for Heidegger the consolidation of the Jewish essence, the gathering of the three powers into a unity. So this would be a uh, kind of reading that he would, uh, he would do of uh, Marx's uh, text on the Jewish question. Indications of Heidegger's proclivity for converting the figure of the Jew into co a complexio oppositorum, that is the complex of opposites, where the otherwise un antithetical traits coexist without the work of dialectical mediation, continue to abound. Besides the religious and the secular, the private and the public, racialization and deracialization, the pair pacifism, militarism is made applicable to international Jewry. Uh, I quote, the imperialistic warlike way of thinking and the humanistic pacifist way of thinking are only dispositions that belong to each other because they are just offshoots of metaphysics. Thus, international jury can also make use of both, can proclaim and bring about one as the means for the other. This machinational co concocting of history catches all players equally in its nets. Again, the key word here is equally, the same equally constructed, equally divided arrangement of the political ontological order. There is more than a grain of truth in saying that war and peace are more and more indistinguishable from the war uh, uh, and, and we can give various examples for, for, for this, from the war to end all wars, which is probably the implied background for this insight, to the permanent states of exception in Agamben, uh, or humanitarian wars, as Danilo Zolo puts it in the late 20th, early 21st centuries. But since Heidegger lots to the Jews the role of the vanguard in the age of the completion of metaphysics, he concentrates this tendency in their hands insofar as all players are equally caught in the nets of this machination, the equally constructed, equally divided arrangement of all beings, at the social level of de-racialization, we have a replica of political uh, meaningless distinctions between right and left as well as war and peace. So uh, at the social level, all differences 
uh, melt into air with this tendency toward deracialization on the political level. We have uh, now meaningless uh, divisions between the right and the left, war and peace, and so on. The non-separation of social and political powers, which is lauded by Marx, shows itself here in the form of a metaphysical co-belonging of different parts in the same homogenized order. It's time to take stock of this exegetical exercise with a kind of critical component that I try to uh, bring to it. First, however, I cannot neglect to mention that Marx can relate to the Jewish question better than Heidegger to the extent that he's more attuned to the singular situations in which this question is raised. Heidegger is not interested in the context at all here, right? He, he does not, uh, insofar as uh, uh, the, the figure of the Jew appears in high, on the pages of Heidegger's black notebooks, the, the context disappears completely. But listen to these words of Marx, on the other hand. The Jewish question presents itself differently according to the state in which the Jew resides. In Germany, where there is no political state, no state as such, the Jewish question is purely theological. In France, which is a constitutional state, the Jewish question is a question of constitutionalism, of the incompleteness of political emancipation. It is only in the free states of North America, or at least in some of them, that the Jewish question loses its theological significance and becomes a truly secular question, unquote. Heidegger, on the, on the contrary, focuses on international Jewry, a theoretical fiction and an abstraction that is on the par with the intangible power he invests in it. So he has this uh, abstract figuration with the intangible power invested in it. He does not feel that he ought to qualify his statements depending on the distinct national context of the Jewish people because for him, the historyless and landless existence of Semitic nomads, in a word, their worldlessness, exceeds all such contexts and justifies a sweepingly generalizing approach. Where are phenomenological, the phenomenological method, fundamental ontology, the hermeneutics of facticity, and the question vis-a-vis -vis this intangible presence accompanied by a barrage of other negations of the world, of history, of decision, and so on. What kind of logos makes it tangible and visible? Is thought absolved of its limits, responsibilities, and fidelity to being when it deals with an object it perceives to be devoid of inherent limits, responsibilities, and ontological bonds? To reiterate the beginning of my talk, Heidegger's failure to pose the Jewish question as question bespeaks a lapse in his thinking about the figuration of metaphysics at the time of its completion. However valid, the rejoinder that the Jew is a wrong figure for this epoch in the history of being is insufficient unless we add that perhaps no figuration at all suits the age of impersonal technologism and technocracy per definitionem, right? In, there simply cannot be a figuration of the end of metaphysics because the, there is no concrete figure corresponding to this. At the same time, the reasons behind the choice of the Jewish figuration in the black notebooks are clear, though certainly indefensible. In the Jew, Heidegger discovers a figureless figure, rid of racial, racial connotations and referring above all to the cosmopolitan Jewish diaspora positioned at the leading edge of globalizing uprootedness. In other words, he comes as close as possible to the notion of an absent presence or a representation without presentation matching the current stage of metaphysics. To put it differently still, he describes the Jews in terms of what we may now call a trace. In a slim but important volume, Heidegger and the Jews, and the Jews is spelled with a, a lowercase j and in quotation marks, Lyotard repeats Heidegger's gesture of dissociating the Jews, spelled with a lowercase j between quotation marks, from prefabricated identitarian categories. I write the Jews this way, Lyotard explains, neither out of prudence nor lack of something better. I use lowercase to indicate that I'm not thinking of a nation. I make it plural to signify that it is neither a figure nor a political, Zionism, religious, Judaism, or philosophical Jewish philosophy subject. I use quotation marks to avoid confusing these Jews with, cap with a lowercase j with the real Jews. The Jews, lowercase, are the object of a dismissal with which the Jews in particular are afflicted in reality." Unquote. So he too writes the Jews as a trace. 
At this point, the other Jewish question, as the question of the other, effectively commences. Outside the strictures of biologist, nationalist, religious, and other impositions, the singular universal question, who are the Jews, or the Jews with a lowercase in quotation marks, is finally raised, spearheading their existential emancipation. Unwittingly, Heidegger has contributed to this enunciation of the question insofar as he, first of all, refused to reduce it to the issue of race, Second, outline the placeless place of the Jews, or the Jews, uh, lowercase in quotation marks, in the history of, of being. And third, distinguished anthropological whatness from existential who-ness. But he also turned up a careless answer when he suggested that the Jews, or the Jews, lowercase, were the faceless face, the obscure and distended figuration, if not the intangible incarnation of the end of metaphysics. In Lyotard's book, and in the thought of Levinas, the Jews, or the Jews in the uh, uh, way that Lyotard spells the word, are, in sharp contrast to Heidegger, the others of metaphysics, who do not fit within its totalizing contours and horizons. As such, they cannot be understood as the representatives of calculation or computation, which is the metaphysical framework for the age of technological rationality, even though ontological homelessness remains crucial to the thinking of their non-identity. The Jews, lowercase quotation marks, never at home wherever they are, writes Lyotard, cannot be integrated, converted, or expelled. They are also always away from home when they are at home in their so-called own tradition because it includes exodus as its beginning, excision, impropriety, and respect for the forgotten, unquote. This, then, is a perfect illustration of how one can think with and against Heidegger, thinking further on his path despite, against, or with his past, as Marcia Sa, Cavalcante Schubach, and I suggest in our commentary on the 1934-35 Hegel seminar. Lyotard's exemplary strategy is one of inversion and intensification, the inversion of the meaning and value of homelessness and the intensification of the process whereby identity is denaturalized, first by being stripped of its bio biological or biologist uh, trappings, derived primarily from the traditional concept of race, and second, by shedding all stable ontic markers and flipping into a non-identity. Not by accident, this move looks almost identical to the repetition of metaphysics after its completion. After all, underlying the Jewish question is the question of metaphysics itself, of its current state or status, possible representation and figuration. It would be ineffective directly to negate metaphysical prejudices replicated in every such negation. Every negation of metaphysical prejudices is only bound to replicate them. And it would be futile simply to reject Heidegger's own prejudices, or worse yet, his entire philosophy tainted by them. If the black notebooks have anything to teach us, it is the art of saying yes, no to Heidegger and by implication to the legacy of metaphysics. Thank you for your attention. I have, I have, yeah, I have <laughs> two questions. Uh, one probably too too big, the other probably too small. But uh, nevertheless, I try to to find a way. Well, in in a, in a manuscript from uh, from I guess uh, forty two or forty forty three, Heidegger says something like that: the Platonic idea is uh, the long the American long distance bomber. Um, and I, I want I want to ask, or I, I want I would I would I would uh, I would s propose uh, um, um, another um, um, uh, a modification of this uh, quotation that that the Platonic idea is the Jew. And of course, you see that this is uh, nonsense right right up from the beginning. But what I want to say is, or what I want to ask is, um, and what is I guess maybe a, a real problem with Heidegger's thinking. 
uh, or with philosophy, <laughs> um, if um, this critique, not critique, if this anti-Semitism uh, is actually an anti-universalism in, in Heidegger, then that means an anti-Platonism, and that means um, an anti-metaphysical standpoint, because uh, metaphysics is in a certain way uh, always a Platonism for, for, for Heidegger. Uh, then um, we uh, we really have to ask what what is the is there a real threat in non metaphysical thinking in Heideggerian thinking because of this uh, uh, because of this destruction and denial of uh, uh, of Platonism um, because uh, for instance if you see Marx. Uh, and his idea of humanity, you can still, uh, well, there are Marx, Marxists who always ask, what is actually the strength, strange uh, humanity in, in Marx? But it's in a certain way you can say, it's a rest of Platonism. Therefore, for instance, uh, but you can be a Platonist and Marxist at the same time. Um, but, but this, if we, if we take away this kind of, of universal um, uh, 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 matrix, uh, of philosophy, then then we have this kind of narratives Heidegger is uh, is telling us, and where where in a certain way the Jew can be the threat of of everything what what is what is in a certain way historical, what belongs to the earth, what belongs to to a certain people, because the Jew is is like the American long distance bomber, the, the Platonic idea in his mobility. And 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 if and because of course that's 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 nonsense. But <laughs> but 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 if this is 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 an internal um, idea of Heideggerian thinking, that that metaphysics metaphysics is is finally this, and we have uh, on the other side only the, the 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 alternative of being historical thinking, then we then then we are really in a critical position in a certain in a, in a aporetic uh, in, a, in a certain cer uh, aporetic uh, position concerning philosophy as such because then we are either metaphysics or we are heideggerians in a certain way but then we have to to accept this strange um, story of of universalism uh, that that was I don't know whether this was very clear, but I guess that this is one of the main questions um, we have with with Levinas in this Heidegger gathering and, and and we and us mm -hmm. uh, uh, must be must philosophy be after after Heidegger an anti universalism and this would be this this would be I guess a problem the other thing is uh, the second this is a small question um, is is it is it possible to, to show that in Heidegger himself, in his philosophy, there are certain ideas um, which actually would, would, uh, would refer to his, to his uh, um, uh, image of the Jews uh, um, in a more interesting way. For instance, if he says in, in Being and Time, the, the non-being at home, is the origin of being at home. Yeah, so that, that's actually an interesting thought, and it's, it has something to do with, with, these, uh, with this fear of mobility or fear of not being at home. Uh, is, is, is Heidegger not himself uh, able to think such a, such a uh, horror for the maybe, maybe later Heidegger, that, that actually in an ontological way, not being in home, uh, being at home is is more original than 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 roots and earth and blood. Yes. So these uh, are, are both very big questions. Uh, I, I will I will try to uh, I'll take them in the order that uh, you ask. Um, I, on on this issue of anti-universalism, uh, what? Uh, w one of the suspicions I have is uh, even if we say that Heidegger is anti-universalist, he nonetheless engages in what I would call an overgeneralization, and I hinted at this in my talk. Uh, not only does he generalize in relation to this figureless figure of the, of the Jews, uh, extracted from any context whatsoever, and presumably uh, the very decontextualized or decontextualizing existence of the Jewish people justifies that kind of an extraction. This is what's between the lines. 
And on the other hand, in his uh, history of being and his uh, 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 really um, uh, a narrative about the, the epochs of, of metaphysics, we also see a kind of uh, overgeneralization on the forgetting of being where uh, disparate philosophies become interchangeable as uh, the avatars of this forgetting, right? Uh, so there is, uh, even if there is a kind of anti-universal uh, impulse in his philosophy, it coexists, strangely enough, with an overgeneralizing one. So, so that Heidegger is tempted to go toward a kind of singularity of a lived, uh, the unity of lived space and time, but at the same time, fall and, and rejects uh, universalism in the name of that singularity of, of lived experience, which he then ties to a national territory in some instances, but at the same time, he uh, fails to, to see the overgeneralizing uh, uh, tendencies that are much worse than the universalization that is still grounded dialectically or otherwise in something singular, right? Uh, so this is just uh, the, the, the first note on, on this. Uh, and uh, yes, so this, it's quite fascinating, this idea of the figure of the, of the Jew as uh, an incarnation of the Platonic idea at the, en at the, age of, uh, the end of metaphysics. And this is what, uh, it would be very much consistent with a passage from the young Hegel that I quoted, where the Jews are the incarnation of the abstract uh, power of ideality, the law that is uh, uh, that is oblivious to all uh, uh, to all life, to all singularity, uh, this abstract empty universalism that simply imposes itself directly on life and therefore deadens and subjugates it, and so forth. Uh, so, and what what is uh, uh, what is uh, Hegel's idea? His idea is that this kind of a uh, tendency in the Jews is going to lead to their self-destruction, as it were, because it's impossible to contain pure ideality in actual existence. Uh, uh, so uh, um, uh, th then we, if, if we transfer that to Heidegger, then uh, we, we have to ask what, what does he foresee then in this kind of uh, growing worldlessness and uh, homelessness that he identifies with the with uh, uh, figure of the Jew that then is the direct implantation of the Platonic idea on Earth, right? If the Platonic idea comes to, to Earth, the Earth becomes barren and becomes a desert, becomes this uh, no man's land in the end. Uh, then uh, what, what happens? Does, does it destroy itself at the global level, as it were? Does it destroy itself in the, at the environmental level? There are hints in that direction as well, I think, in Heidegger, that that, uh, that destruction then uh, takes the environmental global proportions that he then uh, uh, sort of links to, to an ontological uh, destruction. So, um, yes, I, 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 don't, I, I don't have an answer to the question, what should we do in the, and I, I tried to, to also hint at that in the end of my remarks, I think that we cannot simply say no to Heidegger, and we cannot also simply say yes to him, just as we cannot do the same vis-a-vis uh, -vis metaphysics. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the idea would be to pursue what Adorno calls a singular universal, neither uh, giving up on uh, the universal vocation of philosophy nor uh, overlooking the singular uh, uh, level that, that Heidegger was so obsessed with himself also, despite all of those generalizing and overgeneralizing tendencies. Uh, uh, okay, so that's the, the first question. And uh, the second question, I, I assume that you, uh, that's a kind of charitable reading of Heidegger where you're saying that uh, in later Heidegger you can see that these negative categories can be actually the ground, this groundlessness can be the new ground for, for the second inception, for the new beginning of the West, for instance, right? So uh, he, he uh, it, it plays, a precise function and role in his in his work. It is not just something that he wants uh, 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 he wants to denounce and uh, dismiss and do away with. He thinks that this groundlessness, this rootlessness, will perhaps uh, bear a new foundation and a new inception 
in that sense. And uh, just one, one more note on this, uh, on this subject. I think that uh, in relation to my work on vegetal philosophy, this inception for Heidegger is going to be vegetal and not animal. This is why he has this critique of, animaliza of the animalization of the human, because for him, in his uh, sort of uh, nostalgia for rootedness, we should take those roots literally. Humans should be plant-like for him, right? And he says that explicitly in his memorial address, uh, uh, when, when he says that spirit has to be rooted in the soil, in the concrete soil, in order to soar to the ether of ideas and blossom as a genius or a talent, right? Again, the implication of that is that such a development of spirit is precluded to the Jewish people who are not rooted in the soil as plants are or as, uh, uh, as the German people are in, in, uh, uh, in, in Heidegger's view. Uh, so, uh, and, and again, in the, in the black notebooks themselves, there is an indication that the second beginning, the second inception, uh, w which he identifies with the Ragnis, with the event, is going to be a recapitulation of the first inception, which he calls Fusis. And by Fusis, he understands the totality of growth. Fusis is a, uh, uh, the, the word for nature, for uh, the Greek word for nature, is for Heidegger, in the first instance, a vegetal term. So there is going to be a recapitulation of that uh, in, in the second inception of, uh, of, of the Iraignis, and he says this very explicitly in, in these uh, volumes, actually. Thank you so much. Um, it was a really great paper. Um, so I have a, a motivating thought, and this is just going to take a moment, but I'll, I've written it down, so hopefully it's clearer than the last time. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So uh, motivating this is, a, is a something that you said, that we can't eliminate, we can't fantasize about eliminating the general mm -hmm. like you can with the exception. But I want to say that Heidegger hopes to, and I think that it's here that we achieve a different ethical status. Um, that is, to dream of canceling the rule or the gigantic we call a reformer but to dream of canceling the exception or the minor or the other, we would call a genocidal fantasy. Okay, so you note in your talk how Heidegger commits the metaphysical error in this characterization or character of, the, of international Jewry. And I think indeed in the 1930s, Heidegger's turn is about basically being the, metaphysician, the metaphysician who hates metaphysics. This connects to a, a comment that came up earlier in uh, Dr. Travigny's talk about how Hitler is the key to uh, Heidegger's loyalty to the Third Reich. It's that Hitler is this politician who hates politics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we have Heidegger in the character of Jewry who is using modernism, the valence of modernism and the tropes of modernism against modernism to deconstruct it, to pass through it, to collapse it, these faulty dualisms. So going back to then this motivating thought about the different ethical status that a dream of reform has versus the dream of genocide. I wonder what if we can think of Heidegger rather than as a Jew-hating Nazi, than as a self-hating Jew. Is there a different kind of ethical upshot there? Thank you. Well, I, um, as I followed your comments, I did not foresee this, uh, the question itself. Um, Right. Uh, on, on this, uh, first, let me say that on this difference between the reformer and uh, uh, the, the genocidal impulse, uh, I think that, um, uh, that, that Heidegger's impulse is also not that of a reformer. He, uh, 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 he doesn't really, I don't think he thinks that anything can be done about, uh, about the current state of metaphysics and that, uh, in fact, that uh, uh, nothing should be done about it exactly. That, uh, the, the idea is that uh, what we were talking about just a moment earlier, that uh, uh, perhaps there is a hope that the general groundlessness would uh, give rise to the new inception. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so it, it is not really a passivity or a giving up on, on politics or action, but uh, um, uh, a, a kind of a kind of expectation that some called messianic, I guess, in that sense. Um, now, uh, so the to to uh, use this rhetoric of uh, of modernism against modernism, uh, 
Uh, yes, so if, if you, you could say that uh, w toward the end of my talk, when I showed that uh, that Leotard does exactly the same as Heidegger, really, with uh, with the figure of the Jew that he disfigures ethically, right? So there's there's a kind of it's not a difference of content, but a difference of emphasis and a difference of tonality. Uh, while uh, Heidegger uh, uh, follows on a long tradition of a disfiguration of the figure of the Jew and then putting it in the service of his narrative of, meta of the history of metaphysics, Lyotard undertakes a similar kind of disfiguration but with an ethical impulse, right? Uh, and, and so, um, uh, uh, so in that sense, Heidegger cannot be uh, uh, only at the formal level if you put the two uh, side by side, uh, can you say that Heidegger is a kind of self-hating Jew? No, uh, I, I think that uh, the, the uh, difference of emphasis matters and the ethical disfiguration as opposed to uh, uh, a kind of calculated uh, uh, disfiguration, and here again, uh, Heidegger's self-hating Jew comes to the fore. He, he calculatedly uh, uh, erases the concrete outlines of the figure of the Jew, uses it as a figure, but a figureless one, right, that becomes so amorphous and abstract and all-pervading that it is a figure at the very limit of figuration or, fi or, or, or of the figural. Um, uh, so this is, uh, I guess, this would be my response to, to your question. Um, that's all we have time for for this session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University. Please visit us at emory.edu.